Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you very much for joining the webinar. Uh, we're just waiting for a few more participants to join us, and then uh, we'll kick off just shortly after 2 o'clock Bangkok time. Good afternoon, everyone, and uh, welcome to the webinar. We'll just give it one more minute, and then we will uh, formally kick off. So uh, thank you for your, for your patience. Thanks. Okay, well, good afternoon, everyone, and uh, thank you very much for joining this webinar on taking forward the IUCN Green List of Protected and Conserved Areas in Asia. It's uh, just gone past the top of the hour, so I think we should uh, begin, uh, begin this, the, the webinar. My name is Scott Perkin. I'm the head of the Natural Resources Group with the IUCN Asia Regional Office. I'm based in Bangkok, Thailand, uh, and it's my pleasure to be your facilitator for the webinar this afternoon. 
This is the third webinar to be organized by the Asia Protected Areas Partnership, or APAP, as we call it for short. It's been designed especially for APAP members, but given the interest in the topic, we have also widened out the uh, invitation list uh, a little bit to give other stakeholders uh, an opportunity to participate as well. We'll hear much more about the IUCN Green List in the next few hours, but just to say that it is the new international sustainability standard, which recognizes fair and effective protected area management. And so today's webinar has really been designed to do three things. First of all, we would like to introduce the IUCN Green List standard to you. We'd like to share some of the experience and the lessons that are being learned from several countries in the region that are already using the Green List standard. And then lastly, we'd like to end with a little bit of a discussion about the future of the IUCN Green List in the Asia region. Excellent. So today's webinar has been divided into two broad sessions. In session one, we'll begin with some opening remarks from the Ministry of Environment, Forest and Climate Change, Government of India, in its capacity as the new co-chair of APAP. This will be followed by an introduction to the IUCN Green List Standard, which will be given by Mr. Dave Ayama from IUCN's Global Protected Areas Program in Switzerland. And then we'll hear some case studies. We'll hear first from uh, China, uh, which was one of the pioneers of uh, adopting the Green List standard in Asia. And then we will hear from Malaysia. We'll have a short break. And then when we resume, we'll continue with the case studies. And in the second session, we'll hear from the Republic of Korea, another uh, early pioneer of the Green List standard and Vietnam. Vietnam has just had uh, a site listed on the green list, making it the first country in Southeast Asia uh, to have a site on the IUCN green list. So we should have a very uh, rich uh, discussion, very rich uh, learnings from these four case studies. And at the end, as I said, we'll close the day with a bit of a discussion about some of the future directions for the green list in Asia. So just a few uh, housekeeping reminders. Uh, we hope to have ample time for discussion and questions. If you'd like to pose a question to any of the speakers today, please put your question in the chat box. The question and answer session will be facilitated by my colleague, Alex McWilliam, and he'll be monitoring the chat box uh, throughout the entire webinar and collating the, the questions for us. To help ensure the smooth running of the webinar, I would kindly request that you keep your microphone on mute and keep your video off unless you are speaking. And I also just wanted to let you know that we will be recording the webinar uh, so that it can be shared with others who aren't able uh, to join us today. And we will also be sure to share all the PowerPoint presentations uh, with the participants uh, after the webinar. I'd like to close by thanking the Ministry of Environment Korea, the Korea National Park Service, the Ministry of the Environment Japan for all their funding support to APAP, which allows us to implement activities such as this. And with that, uh, let me say welcome again to all our participants. And without any further ado, I would like to invite Sri Rohit Tiwari Inspector General of Wildlife with the Ministry of Environment, Forest and Climate Change, Government of India, to finally give his opening remarks. <laughs> Tuari, over, over to you. Uh, uh, good afternoon. Uh, I hope you can hear me. We can hear you well, thank you. So uh, on behalf of the Ministry of Environment, Forest and Climate Change, Government of India, I welcome you to this webinar on the IUCN Green List of Protected and Conserved Areas. Uh, this webinar is being held under the auspices of the Asia Protected Areas Partnership, a network of 21 government protected area agencies from 17 countries across the region. Uh, the Ministry of Environment, Forest and Climate Change, Government of India, 
has been a member of this partnership since uh, 2016. And I'm uh, very happy to say that in December 2020, India became the third co-chair of APAP, taking over from the Ministry of Environment Korea. And I'd like to take this opportunity to commend Korea for its leadership over the last three years, which has provided uh, this partnership with a very solid foundation on which to build. Uh, India looks forward to taking up the responsibility and to further expanding the reach and achievements of APAP. Uh, this webinar is the first uh, uh, event in which India is participating in its role as APAP co-chair. Co I think that the IUCN Green List is a very appropriate topic for our debut. India has been concerned about uh, enhancing the management effectiveness of its protected areas for many years now. And uh, the results of the most recent assessment of uh, some um, 146 national parks and wildlife sanctuaries, which was done in 2018-19 uh, were announced last year. And uh, these results show that uh, our uh, national parks and sanctuaries have an average score of 62%, which is significantly higher than the global average. So India has also developed its own uh, management effectiveness tracking tool known as M-STRIPES, which stands for Monitoring System for Tigers, Intensive Protection and Ecological Status. M-STRIPES was launched in uh, 2010 and was specifically designed to help strengthen the management of India's tiger reserves. And uh, more recently, uh, India has adopted the CATS, the Conservation Assured Tiger Standards for use across um, uh, all its tiger reserves. We have 51 tiger reserves as of now. Um, India's emphasis on management effectiveness has uh, really paid off. Uh, uh, among our successes, we have been able to conserve and expand the population of um, a number of threatened species including not only the tiger, but also the Asian elephant and the Asiatic lion and many more. Uh, so uh, we very much look forward to uh, learning more about the IUCN green list of protected and conserved areas and the ways in which uh, it can build upon and complement these other initiatives. And uh, now I know that uh, we have a very busy agenda ahead of us today, so I'll end my remarks here. Once again, I welcome you to today's webinar and thank you for making the time to participate. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much for those opening remarks, Mr. Tiwari. And uh, we very much look forward to having India serving as the new co-chair of, of APAP. Uh, as you rightly said, India has a tremendous amount of experience when it comes to protected area management. And we're very much looking forward to, to learning more about India's uh, very long history uh, of, of effective protected area management. So thank you again. Uh, if I may now invite uh, Mr. Dave Ayama, the Community Manager of the IUCN Green List of Protected and Conserved Areas, based in our Global Protected Areas Program in Switzerland, to give his overview of the IUCN Green List Standard. Thanks very much, Scott. Just checking that you can hear me okay. We can hear you. Yeah, thank you. And do you prefer if I share my slides or do you do it from your side? We can do it either way, however you'd like to, to do it. Dev. Okay, let me try sharing my screen and then... Okay, if, if there's any problems, we can back up. Great, thanks. If you can just confirm, Scott, that you can see my slides on slideshow mode. That looks that looks perfect. Thanks. Okay, great. Good afternoon, everyone. Good morning from Switzerland. Thank you so much for joining us. My name is Devaya Ayama. I'm, as Scott mentioned, with IUCN, based in IUCN headquarters with IUCN's Global Protected Areas Program. I'm the community manager for the IUCN Green List. And as part of my role, that's supporting a growing global community of protected and conserved area practitioners uh, that are working together to recognize and improve protected and conserved areas around the world. And um, 
as part of my role, I do support the increasing momentum that we're seeing of the green list uh, in Asia. And I work very closely uh, with Scott and his team in our Bangkok office to, um, to support the Asia region, uh, thanks to some of the donors that, uh, that Scott mentioned uh, that support uh, the promotion of the green list uh, work in the region. In today's global overview of the green list, I'm just going to cover a bit of the background around the green list. What are its key objectives? The 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 way the IUCN green list fits into IUCN's uh, global strategic areas. Give you a quick overview of the IUCN green list standards and talk briefly about the process of its implementation and the. Um, the global benefits and values that we're seeing um, from the implementation of the IUCN Green List. It's for IUCN, the IUCN Green List is a relatively new initiative. It was piloted at the last World Pox Congress in 2014 in Sydney. Um, and really the, the first version of the, of the standard uh, was launched at the last IUCN World Conservation Congress in 2016. And we've got into active implementation mode um, in 2017 uh, and onwards. So what is the mission of the IUCN Green List of Protected and Conserved Areas? It is to increase and recognize the number of effective, protected and conserved areas globally. I should mention in the background, in these slides, you will see images of green listed sites from around the world. We have around currently 49 sites that are on the IOSN green list uh, with several hundred candidate sites. So just to break down the mission of the IOSN green list, um, it's equally important for IUCN that the, that the IUCN Green List standard serves not only to recognize areas that are well managed and fairly governed, but also to use the standard to increase the number of protected and conserved areas uh, that are well managed and, um, and fairly governed. And so the mission is both increasing and recognizing, as well as it applies to both protected and conserved areas globally. So these are areas that would meet the IUCN def definition of protected area as well as areas that would be considered as other effective area-based conservation measures. And that's the conserved areas piece. So the intent is that this is an area-based standard that serves both for legally protected areas or privately protected areas, areas that would meet the IUCN definition of protected areas, as well as going beyond what we would consider as a protected area into the OECM uh, space. And that's an area that we're seeing increasing interest in the IUCN Green List as well. From IUCN's perspective, when we talk about effective management of protected areas, we are not talking just about effectively managed, but equally important is inclusive governance or equitable governance or fair governance. And you'll see that reflected in, in the, as the first component of the standard, which I'll introduce to you in a few slides. Inclusive governance, effective management, and evidence demonstrating that conservation values have been identified and successfully conserved. Those are key aspects of the standard and evidence is required to be compiled to demonstrate these key aspects. Also, the standard requires that protected areas are able to demonstrate some of their ecosystem service benefits. As we all know, protected areas provide an important societal role in our response to climate change mitigation and adaptation, as well as contribution to other global challenges such as water security and food security. So there are criteria and indicators in the standard that where, where a protected area uh, can demonstrate how it's contributing some of these important uh, responses. In terms of the key 
objectives. The, the first one is really about strengthening successful area-based conservation outcomes with the standard that provides a suitable mechanism and measure. Secondly, it's about building a global community. As you know, in IUCN, we, we have a global community through the World Commission on Protected Areas. This is a, a global uh, network of over 3,000 uh, practitioners and experts working on protected and conserved area issues. And the IUCN Green List standard is, a, is one standard that um, can serve to further activate this community and be engaged closely with um, the IUCN World Commission, as well as other commissions of IUCN. And again, it's about creating a community uh, that's working on issues related to the standard and using the standard to build uh, capacity, uh, both on management effectiveness as well as protected area governance. And thirdly, it's about facilitating collaboration across this community for the improvement of the management performance and governance of these areas. When we're talking about the contribution of the IUCN Green List Initiative to global sustainability goals, these three areas are IUCN's three strategic areas that frame our work. This is from um, our last uh, four-year program and we have just released our, our latest four-year program, uh, which has similar areas. Um, but the, the heartland work of IUCN is, is around valuing and conserving nature, of course. This is where um, some of our other knowledge products, such as the IUCN Red List of Threatened Species, the IUCN Red List of Ecosystems, come under this work, as well as the IUCN Green List. But as you'll see, there are also two other strategic areas that IUCN works on, and these are around promoting and supporting effective and equitable governance of natural resources and the deployment of nature-based solutions to address global sustainability challenges. And the Greenest Standard is designed to also contribute to these strategic areas in terms of equitable governance, as well as nature-based solutions to sustainability challenges. In the backdrop of our work, there's of course the UN Sustainable Development Goals, SDGs 14 and 15 in particular, of course, relate to biodiversity, but there are many other SDGs that the, that the Greenest Standard and, and more broadly IUCN's work contribute to. Getting a bit more specific into the UN Convention on Biological Diversity. I'm sure a lot of us here are familiar with the, with the different IT targets. And uh, the one most relevant to protected and conserved areas is of course IT target 11. And the, 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 of course the, the discussions of the post 2020 uh, biodiversity framework are, um, are also featuring protected and conserved areas in as a priority. But the way the IUCN Green List contributes specifically to IHC Target 11 is, um, as you'll see, the text here states, of course, the, the, the global uh, percentages of terrestrial and coastal and marine, marine areas. Those are the 17% and 10% uh, targets um, that were generally on track uh, with, at least on the terrestrial side. Um, but what's equally important to this target is the second half of this statement around these areas needing to be conserved through effectively and equitably managed, ecologically representative and well-connected systems of protected areas and other effective area-based conservation measures and integrated into the wider landscape and seascape. And this is exactly what the IUCN Green List standard is, is trying to contribute uh, to by implementing the IUCN Greenness Standard, um, protected and conserved areas can ensure uh, that these areas are effective and equitably managed and that they are considering the larger um, landscape and seascape context. So IUCN has been working within the CBD processes to get the recognition of the IUCN Green List of protected and conserved areas. As you can see here at, at COP13 in Mexico, uh, there was a decision of CBD parties to promote the IOC Green List as a voluntary standard to encourage protected area management effectiveness. And in the ongoing post-2020 framework discussions, the IOC Green List standard uh, will be promoted as a measure for the quality elements of protected areas for biodiversity and climate change under target two. So 
So now I'll get into just introducing the standards, giving you an overview of the implementation process. Uh, in the interest of time, we may not get into very much detail, but of course we have uh, more detailed presentations so that you can get insights into how it actually works um, in the different countries um, in the Asia region. So the first point around the standard is that it's a, it's a global standard. It addresses, as I've, as I've mentioned, not just management effectiveness, but other cost-cutting themes such as ecosystem services, governance, the global standard can be adapted to the national jurisdictional context and there's independent evaluation of its implementation and the standard itself is based on IUC and best practices and our different knowledge products related to protective and conserved area management. The standard is structured a lot around four components. We would, what we would see is three foundational components of good governance, sound design and planning, and effective management. These three components lead to successful conservation outcomes, which is the fourth component. Very quickly, this is an overview of, of the 17 criteria of the standard. So as I mentioned, there's four components around these four thematic areas. In total, there are 17 global criteria. So these would be conditions that we would expect protected and conserved areas uh, to, uh, to meet. And they would demonstrate that they're complying with these conditions uh, through providing evidence, uh, which will then be evaluated. Underlying each of these criteria are about two or three indicators that indicate the kind of evidence and information that sites need to provide to demonstrate uh, that these 17 criteria and ultimately these, uh, these four components are, are being met. Um, these are just the titles of the, of the conditions. So to give you an idea in the good governance components, um, the requirements around guaranteeing legitimacy and voice, achieving transparency and accountability, enabling governance vitality and capacity to respond actively and so forth. You could, I'll give you a moment to have a look at the titles of the rest of the criteria. As a quick overview of the implementation, the IUCN Green List initiative is a voluntary initiative and it really starts from the ground. The commitment comes from the site, from the sites, um, as well as so it starts with sites being interested in in implementing the ISO Green List, and uh, we then work with the um, management authorities that are involved with that site um, at a national or jurisdictional level, uh, and that becomes a, a commitment from a country to implement the process because the implementation of the of the Green List starts at a national level. Um, but typically we look for, for interest at a, at a site level, so we are sure that the, the standard will be implemented in some sites in a country. Once the commitment is, um, is formalized, we have a good interest from, from a at a country level and some interest from, from, from some sites. We will convene uh, a national expert of uh, called an EAGLE. This is an expert assessment group for the Green List. The EAGLE is a group of experts uh, that um, is selected through an open public call. These are experts that have expertise in issues related to the, um, to the standards. So not just in management effectiveness, but also in, in governance issues, in socioeconomic issues that relate to protected and conserved areas. And they review the, the, the 50 indicators of the standard, um, which are meant to be globally applicable. There's an opportunity for them to adapt those indicators to the national context. If they do an adaptation that goes through a public consultation, and then there's an IUCN stand, Green List Standard Committee that will approve the adapted version to make sure that it's consistent with the global standard, and then sites can begin implementing that standard. So EGLES um, are expert assessment groups, and um, you, when you when we talk about the, the greenness implementation, you hear this acronym uh, a lot. 
Um, so they don't have anything to do with eagles, uh, but here's a, a nice picture of an eagle. Um, but the idea is that these are, uh, these are experts that are drawn uh, from the country. Um, so it's also about um, drawing from the pool of experts in any country that we're implementing in the green list who do the evaluation uh, because they are experts in, um, in the issues related to the standard in that particular jurisdiction. IUCN, along with um, uh, our training and assurance partner, conducts a training uh, for these experts to become green list evaluators. As I mentioned, they, this group is responsible then for reviewing the standard. And it is this group that then serves as the evaluators um, for the sites that then um, they will recommend these sites um, once they've reviewed uh, the full files of the, of the sites. Uh, and will uh, and have assessed that they meet the standard, they then recommend them uh, for green listing. That's at the national level. Just to give you a quick I idea of what happens at the site level. So there's three phases to, um, to the implementation at site level. There's an application phase where the site uh, does an online registration where it commits to um, implementing and achieving the standard. As part of that, it does a self-assessment against five indicators that are what we would um, call eligibility indicators. So these are some of the fundamental requirements of um, just checking that you would meet some fundamental requirements before the site embarks on um, the full effort to implement the standard. So this is that there's that the site meets the IUC definition of protected area or conserved area, uh, that it has a management plan or functional equivalent, uh, that it has legal tenure um, over the area that it has transparently communicated um, this information to the public. The expert group, a representative of the expert group does a check of this um, information and then um, the site is admitted to candidate phase. Candidate phase is really where the bulk of the work happens. Um, so this is where the site provides evidence um, against all of the criteria and indicators. Uh, there's an important point here around stakeholder consultation. So it's important for IUCN um, for the site to, to do the self-assessment um, but also uh, to get input from stakeholders that are interested in the management and governance of the site uh, to get their, their perceptions and input in terms of how the site is being governed uh, and managed. There's also a site visit done by one or two representatives of the expert group uh, to make sure that, the, um, that some of the evidence can be verified. And um, this site visit um, happens over a few days uh, it's also where EGLE members uh, will interview uh, stakeholders uh, to ensure that there be good opportunities for stakeholder input. Now, if you're a well-managed site with good information compiled already, um, between application to candidate phase and its completion should take a, between three to six months is what we've seen um, around the world. If in the candidate phase you identify certain challenges, certain actions need to be done in terms of where the site is performing in some of the criteria and what is expected from the standard. And this is, this is part of the intention of the standard is to help identify gaps and provide direction uh, for how to address those gaps. So sites will typically have action plans and this can take uh, one or two years for, well, depending on what actions uh, need to be taken. Um, sites would then implement those action plans. And, and that's why we, we, we've seen um, that can be maybe one or two years to implement those actions. Um, and we do put a, um, a five-year time limit on the maximum time that, we, that it, we would suggest for a site to move from application phase to green list phase, uh, because we want to encourage sites to improve, um, but not have too much of a, of a time pressure. So. Uh, five years is considered enough time to improve capacity. And then if the, once the, the expert group is assessed that the site meets the standard, it's recommended to, the, um, to be added to the green list. That recommendation comes to a global uh, IUCN green list committee, uh, which is like a global panel that does a final review. Um, and then the site is added to the green list. And the, the certificate is valid um, for a period of, of five years. This is to ensure that the site 
continues to perform at the level of the standard. So it's not a permanent certification. We want to make sure that the site is performing at the level of the standard even after it, it receives a certificate. So there's a midterm review around the two, three year mark to make sure that things haven't changed on the ground. Um, where things have changed on the ground, and maybe there are, there are some gaps again against the standard, uh, the sites will then have two or three years to address those gaps. So by the time of the five year uh, renewal of their certification, uh, they've taken measures to, uh, to make sure that the site continues to perform. We also expect that the standard itself is going to evolve as with all sustainability standards. Um, the, the standard will evolve um, to make sure that it's a, a comprehensive standard, that it's reflecting um, all of IUCN good practice. And so um, if the standard, the standard should evolve every four to five years, um, and then all sites will be expected to comply with the latest version of the standard. The standard complies with some of the best practices around standard setting. I'm not going to go get into the detail of this, um, but we follow uh, some credibility principles around good standard setting and uh, we work with an independent um, accreditation and assurance partner uh, that's Assurance Services International, um, who also works with, with other standards. When protected areas and conserved areas join the green list, they get access to our cloud-based data platform, which is called Compass. It's, a, it's basically a, a digital platform through which um, sites provide all of the evidence. Uh, so when, sites, uh, when we talk about sites providing evidence, they provide evidence um, into this digital platform uh, that then becomes um, available to expert groups who do the evaluation of this material, they can access this, this material as soon as it's made available on the platform. Um, so it's a very easy uh, to access database that, that enables expert groups uh, wherever they're located um, to have access to that evidence uh, instantaneously. Sites, once they are admitted to the Green List, are also, also have site profiles publicly on iucngreenlist.org, which is a newly launched website, uh, as well as uh, um, on the World Database and Protected Areas. We work with uh, UNWCMC on making sure that Green List candidate sites and Green Listed sites um, um, are known on the, on the World Database as, as well. So to give a quick summary of some of the values of the IUCN Green List from IUCN's perspective, from our global experience in, in implementing the Green List standard over, over the, uh, the last few years, one is around having expert validation of site level implementation and, and success. And that's, the, um, that's the, the role of the Eagle to, to provide that independent evaluation uh, and the capacity building that can come um, from the implementation, of course, of the, um, of the standard. The second is around achieving global recognition for local conservation success. So through the implementation of the standard um, and uh, the independent evaluation process, um, the, the site is getting IUCN validation of its successes, uh, not just on, on conservation outcomes, but also on um, fair, inclusive and equitable governance. It provides an opportunity for sites to enhance the, the communications of their good efforts um, in these areas. As I've covered before, it contributes to global sustainability goals. Um, and it can also leverage aligned approaches, assessment tools, and investments. And I'm just going to wrap up um, in my remaining five minutes here by giving you some idea of what we mean when we talk about leveraging um, other aligned approaches. The IOC Greenest standard um, is is meant to be able to build on other approaches, other tools. Um, as I've mentioned already, it is, it is a standard that is built um, on IUCN best practice, on, on IUCN publications, um, such as our best practices around governance on the IUCN management effectiveness framework. Um, so it's already building on, on material that's out there. It's building on, on tools um, and an assessment approaches uh, that exist. It's, it's not meant to, uh, to be reinventing uh, what's existing, but rather building on it and adding value. 
So very quickly, in the interest of time, I can't get into too much detail, uh, but when we talk about management effectiveness, which uh, tools and MET is um, obviously the, one of the better known management effectiveness method methodologies, the IOC and Green List standard builds very much on the, on the management effectiveness methodology. Um, just to show you the IOC and WCPA framework for protected area management effectiveness, uh, which includes six elements, context planning, inputs, process, outputs, and outcomes, and um, the evaluation cycle that you see here on the right-hand side. Uh, the emphasis of MET is about evaluating information about how well the management is being carried out currently through a systematic and relatively quick self-assessment. Uh, and, uh, and of course, MET itself has evolved and is now available with its most recent launch um, in 2020 through an Excel tool that aids the implementation and compilation of, of results. The MET consists currently of two main sections. So these are the first one around data sheets that collect key information on the protected area, its characteristics, threats, and management objectives. And then an assessment form that provides a composite measurement across different parameters that integrate these six elements of the framework. As I mentioned, it's a, it's a self-assessment. It's designed around a, a questionnaire with four responses so that a, a site can, can self-evaluate itself and assign um, a score in terms of its perception of performance. And this can range between zero to, uh, to three, zero being poor, three being excellent. So just to say that the, the ISN green list process all of this information that's compiled through, if any protected or conserved area has done a MET, all of the information that's compiled through a MET is very relevant for the greenness process. A protected area that has conducted a MET analysis is already at an advantage in the greenness process because the area already will have the information um, easily accessible, compiled. You would be able to provide that information quickly for the application phase a lot of that information is going to be used in, in the candidate phase. In areas where uh, the site may have scored itself, um, let's say less than three, where it's dealing with some challenges, uh, those are particular areas where the, stand, the IOC and Greenest Standard can provide uh, direction against these benchmark criteria in terms of what is needed um, for the site to improve. Um, in areas where the site is doing well, if it's scoring itself on a three, it can also use these benchmark um, performance criteria in the greenest standard to understand how it compares to what IUCN would consider as good practice. The greenness process, of course, is longer than, than a MET process and it goes beyond just a self-assessment. So it requires that there's stakeholder input, uh, that there's transparency in the assessment process. So it's adding, um, it's adding additional um, information, uh, adding additional stakeholder perspectives, and that's part of the, that's part of um, inclusive uh, governance aspects, um, which the MET is not necessarily designed to, to assess. So the standard requires evidence of achieving good governance, um, as well as the standard requires that the site demonstrates um, specific evidence um, that the, all of the major natural values, um, as well as ecosystem and, and cultural values that have been identified, are actually being successfully conserved and so that there's actual um, evidence. This is again, an area where MET4 is starting to get into this, uh, but the, the greenest standard is meant to go beyond um, what MET would do and actually uh, require that sites have, um, have that uh, conservation evidence. Finally, the, of course, the Eagle provides um, an independent um, assessment of this information, and the ISN certification is that is that validation uh, versus a MET, which is uh, which is essentially um, a self-assessment uh, and doesn't necessarily have that independent um, uh, assessment aspect. A lot more information around MET uh, can be found, of course, on the Management Effectiveness uh, Portal on on Protected Planet, uh, where there's also a green list section as well. So I'll be quick um, in my last minute here, just to, just to say in, in the same context of how MET is very relevant um, to the green list, um, information compiled with other, uh, through other conservation standards can also be used for green listing. So we work, IUCN is part of the, of the CATS initiative. Uh, this is um, 
a conservation assured tiger standard uh, driven by uh, WWF. Um, IUCN is also um, involved with its design and implementation. Uh, and so we work together to, um, to ensure complementarity. Um, so while CATS uh, is a tiger conservation standard, it focuses on, uh, on the tiger species and, and habitat. Um, there's complementarity in that the, uh, the greenest standard um, um, is going further in terms of its requirements around um, good governance um, criteria, uh, as well as um, if you're implementing CATS and the green list, um, you'll also be look, ensuring that all major site values are being identified um, in addition. And CATS will help with ensuring that there are um, that there's good information and data around uh, the tiger species and its and its habitat and prey, um, but the greenest standard can complement that by ensuring that all of the major site values are identified and that there are performance thresholds for all of those performance uh, for all of those conservation values. So the tiger standard would would help with identification and setting of performance thresholds for for the tiger species, and the greenest standard would work. Um, in concert with that to, um, to look at um, establishing some performance thresholds for some of the other uh, major, major natural values. <clears throat> Lastly, we also see that there's a good complementarity between the IUCN Green List standard and um, its potential to support World Heritage nomination. So one out of every, one out of seven greenlist sites is a World Heritage site currently. So we have several World Heritage sites that are um, IUCN um, greenlisted. Um, and the standard and certification process can ensure that the integrity, protection, and management of all major site values, which would include uh, those values of outstanding universal value which are the values that the World Heritage Convention focuses on um, are maintained successfully over the long term. And as part of a nomination process, um, a tentative site needs to demonstrate that it has integrity of management and the Green List standard and certification can help demonstrate that. Um, as well, the Green List standard and community can help tentative sites to identify any significant gaps in governance and management effectiveness and provide clear direction um, so that it can help sites improve their management. Um, and it's a, a fully complementary and incent incentivized approach uh, to all sites so that even if the site is not successful necessarily on its World Heritage nomination, it would be able, it would still get the IUCN validation and the global recognition that comes with that. In closing, just to give you a quick idea of the green list in, in numbers. As I mentioned, we have 49 green list sites from 15 countries around the world. Um, this map, this small map here on the right hand side gives you an idea of the, the global spread of these green list sites. Um, as you can see, it's quite a, quite a wide geographic diversity. Um, we are implementing in over 50 countries currently in terms of the um, the national um, implementation process, so establishing eagles. So we have about 500 candidate sites that are um, um, either formally registered in our in our system or um, interested in in registering and implementing the standard. Um, we have over 30 expert groups. So some of these regions also form regional expert groups that are that are covering multiple countries. Where there are small states, for instance, in the Middle East and West Asia region, we have a regional eagle. Um, so that's also a possibility. Uh, we have lots of partner organizations because the Green List is implemented through partnering with national organizations. Uh, and of course, on the, on the global governance side, we have some of these committees that I, that I mentioned uh, supported by some of these donors um, mentioned here. And with that, I'm going to hand it back to, to Scott. Thank you. Thank you very much, Deb, for that uh, comprehensive overview of the, the Green List. I think one of the things that I personally particularly like about the Green List is that it's, it's a positive message. You know, in conservation, we're, we're so often used to the negative messaging about, you know, the IUCN 
red list of threatened species, species going extinct, the uh, World Heritage Sites in Danger list. And, uh, you know, in general, the conservation message is often pretty, pretty bleak. But the, the green list is, is the flip side of that. It's, it's about recognizing excellence. It's about recognizing areas that are being well managed uh, and are achieving their conservation outcomes. And I, I personally find that quite, quite inspiring. I'll hand over now to, uh, to Alex just to coordinate uh, a brief question and answer session. We have uh, about 10, 12 minutes for any uh, questions that you might have. I've seen a couple have come through in the, uh, in the chat box. Please do continue to send in your questions if you would like to, to raise anything. Uh, Alex, over, over to you. Great, thanks, Scott. And uh, yes, as Scott mentioned, we'll try to to keep on time uh, throughout the rest of the webinar. So we've got about uh, about thirteen minutes for questions, and let me pose a couple first to you, Dev, that have come up in the chat. Um, and the first question is around uh, the green list criteria or indicators, and can those be framed at a regional level? And the concern here is about that perhaps. Uh, each country or region where the green list might be uh, uh, adopted might not fall into the same general framing of the indicators that are used at a global level. So can the green list criteria and indicators be framed at a regional level? Yes, and I, uh, the short answer is yes. And I'll just mention that also f to Scott and others in IUCN to feel free to jump on and add to some of my answers um, because there's lots of uh, people here that know the green list well. Um, and so the short answer is yes, the, um, the global standard is 17 criteria uh, that um, those, those are what uh, we would say would be fixed, um, but underlying that are 50 indicators that are uh, globally applicable. And um, in each country that we implement uh, as part of the, the training of the expert group, um, the expert group will review those 50 indicators and assess whether some of them can be adapted to the national or regional context. So as I, as I mentioned earlier, the, the implement both at a country level in, in some regions where, there's, where there may be many sm small countries with a very similar protected area context, such as the Middle East region. Um, they've, they have um, looked at the indicators and adapted them for the, for the regional, regional context. I will say though that typically the um, um, the majority of the indicators uh, work well um, in in many countries around the world. Um, typically, we may see ten percent or less of those indicators that actually get adapted to the to the country or regional context. All right. Thanks, Dev. And the next question we have um, relates to the following, and that is, Dev. Um, could you comment on the use of the green list standard as a guide to managers on best, protect, uh, best practice management separate from the processes of adding the, a site to the green list uh, itself? Yeah, absolutely. That's a good point. And the, the, the green list standard and its accompanying user manual is, a, is an open access standard. It's, it's publicly available. Uh, it's meant to be... Um, a global reference and a global benchmark of, of how, how IUCN defines um, best practice at a, at a site level. Um, so absolutely it should be, it can be used as a, as a guide um, for, um, and for sites that um, may still be in early stages um, um, of, um, of, of understanding how standards can help uh, improve management. Um, it's still beneficial to to use the standard to um, to see the kinds of information that it requires. Um, it's beneficial for maybe new protected areas that are designing management plans uh, that um, could be aligned well with the standard. So that um, after compiling some of this information or after designing a new management plan, they would be well positioned to embark on a, on a green list process at some point uh, in the future if they choose to do so. As I mentioned, it's a it's a voluntary process, um, so it's really up to the site to decide if they want to embark on that certification process. But absolutely, they can they can use the standard as a as a guide, um, um, independent of that process. In some countries, um, Colombia, France, Mexico, as examples, they are they're making reference to the ISN Green List standard at a national level. Um, 
and encouraging the entire system of protected areas to aim towards the greenest standards. So that they may not yet have committed all of this, all of the sites in the country to, to the green list, but it's an example where they're um, at a national level, the national authority is promoting the use of the standard as a, uh, in terms of an open access. Thanks, Dev, and uh, encourage colleagues on the on the webinar to uh, please place your questions in the chat, um, and I can raise them with the relevant person, most likely Dev. Uh, Dev, let me follow on from that uh, question and ask you about further the the eagles and uh, these expert advisory groups. And you mentioned that there uh, there's an open public call put out in each country to establish the eagles. What is the common size of the expert advisory groups that have already been established? Are they 30 people or five or 10? Um, firstly, and let me add, secondly, do they have a role in advising the sites? They will obviously conduct the assessments that you mentioned, the evaluations, but do they also play a role in advising the sites on how to improve on areas that have been uh, seen to have shortfalls in the assessments? Thanks, Alex. Good question. So to the first point, uh, yeah, it depends on the size of the country, I would say. So uh, typically the, the range of uh, eagle size is five to 15 members. Um, so if, uh, if it's a smaller country, um, it's, it can be less than 10. I would say the average size is between 10 to 12 individuals. Um, it's important for us to ensure that there's um, uh, that there's diversity, so it's not just, so firstly that there's diversity of sector, so it's um, um, representing government, civil society organizations, academia, uh, that there's gender balance, that there's expertise on um, all of the different issues related to the standard. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, not just management effectiveness, but also on issues related to governance, on issues related to socioeconomic issues, and therefore, um, based on the context of the country that can that can influence the size um, of the eagle um, but i would say probably five is on is too small um, but the typical number is between eight to twelve um, in large countries such as china it can go up to um, over 20 individuals but um, generally we would we would keep probably a, a maximum size of 20 25 individuals um, but generally on average it's um, it's around that 10 to 12 number um, on the second point, um, yes, that's an, it's an important point. So the, the Eagle members are really meant to be uh, evaluators and, and in order for them to be independent, they cannot actually advise uh, the sites on how to implement the standard because that would be a, there would be a conflict of interest there. So when we, when we do the training, uh, as part of that training, um, Eagle members have to sign a, um, a declaration of engagement um, that will also declare any conflicts of interest that uh, they may have. Uh, so sometimes Eagle members uh, may have worked with, with protected areas um, uh, or sometimes we even may have, um, we can have even park directors that um, um, are Eagle members, but they would, in some regions where there may be a smaller pool of experts, uh, but they would recuse themselves from actually voting on their own site or on sites that they know well. Uh, because there, um, there would be a conflict of interest. Um, and so uh, the idea is that they're really serving as, as evaluators. And um, we do have a role um, uh, as well that we're working on developing. A lot of the effort right now has been on, on, training, um, on training of expert members and eagles. Uh, but we also have a role um, of site mentors uh, in the green list uh, ecosystem, where um, sites can um, can agree with a, with a volunteer um, or a partner organization that is help, is um, collaborating with them to improve management and governance, uh, and um, site mentors can directly advise um, the sites in terms of how to implement the standard, and they can support um, support the site in compiling information, and it can be very helpful and uh, and beneficial. Uh, for sites to uh, to have a site mentor, uh, it can um, help them um, advance, let's say, more more quickly through through the process. It, um, it helps them understand a bit some of our um, our systems, like the like the digital system. I hope that answered your questions. That's great, Deb. Yeah, thanks very much for that. And I thought I think your response there would be quite useful for the for the participants on the webinar as well. 
I have lots of questions, but let me turn <laughs> and do my job as facilitator uh, and return to the comments and the questions that have been raised in the chat. And the next one is, uh, is directed to you, Scott. Uh, can you comment on how you see the green list fitting in with the APAP agenda uh, here in the region and the potential for it to work at a regional level, perhaps aiming for the most significant sites across the region uh, for green listing? and also as a means of sharing experiences and best practices across the region as well. Scott. Sure, thanks, uh, thanks a lot for the question. Uh, I think APAP is actually very well designed to help take forward and, and promote the green list. One of the things we're particularly keen on, on using APAP for is to share experience and learnings across the region uh, among countries that are already using the green list but also between countries that haven't yet adopted the standard and those that, that have. Uh, and I think you know, today's webinar is actually a perfect example of, of, of that sort of thing. However, we've also created a working group under uh, the auspices of APAP, uh, a special working group on the green list. It was supposed to be inaugurated uh, last year, but then of course, COVID-19 hit. Uh, we really want to have this as a face-to-face, in-person uh, working group. So we've, we've put it on hold for the moment and have switched to these sorts of uh, online platforms for the time being. But our vision is still that this working group will be set up under APAP. We will get countries meeting face-to-face -face, and we will use that in a very informal way, very constructive way, very frank way just to share experiences and, and learnings. Uh, we're also keen on continuing to, to build capacity for the green list, uh, perhaps through dedicated technical workshops for those who are interested in learning more about the standard. Uh, a couple of years ago, one of the APAP technical workshops was in fact on management effectiveness. And we did have uh, a half a day spent entirely uh, on the green list uh, and so that was kind of the, the first introduction, but I think it provides a foundation for, for building on, on further, uh, and perhaps having more in-depth technical workshops in the future. As far as sort of looking at sites that could be prioritized, I would say we've done uh, less, less on that. Uh, that's certainly something we could look at uh, in, the, in the future. Um, but at the moment, our priority uh, focus has really been around uh, sharing experience, building capacity, raising raising awareness. Thanks for the question. I'm just wondering, Alex, if we should maybe move on now, unless there are any other burning questions in your chat box. No, the, the chat box is clear of all the questions raised by the group. I, I suggest in the interest of time, we proceed with, uh, with the remainder of the webinar. Okay, great. All right, thanks, Alex. Thanks for the question. Keep them coming. Um, but I'd like now to turn to China, which was one of the early adopters of the IUCN Green List standard and has a, a particularly rich experience to share. And I would like to invite Professor Li, who's the vice chair of the China Eagle, uh, to give his presentation about the experiences in China. Professor Li, over to you. Oh, okay. This one. Yeah. Hello. Go to. We can we can see your slides, but could I please request you to put it on uh, presentation mode, slideshow mode? Great. That's, that's, that's perfect. Yeah, we're all set. Please, please go ahead. Okay, everyone. Uh, I have just to give a brief introduction about the uh, green list uh, protected area. Uh, to, uh, some current states and the future prospect. And uh, uh, this is a uh, Six, uh, con uh, the first is about the background of China protected area. 
after more than six years of development, there, there are more than uh, 20,000 natural, 12,000 uh, protected area established in China and cover about 80% uh, of Chinese land area. A very protected uh, 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 different uh, uh, steps. So for something is focus on uh, about water conservation and uh, uh, some things about uh, uh, the uh, geological uh, wetland and uh, water park, some, something. This is a, a general distribution of the protected area in China. And uh, also uh, some species of the West, the West patterns and the uh, ecosystem service function important area also covered by the protected area. Now, um, re, uh, in, within three years, a new system of protected area uh, categorized uh, in China. And uh, uh, something is a uh, uh, national park uh, pilot area. Uh, in uh, within the five years and the uh, national uh, uh, results is uh, about uh, two thousand more than two thousand uh, natural results and uh, uh, various uh, natural park. So um, the uh, the basic. Uh, important area covered by the uh, protected areas, but how to improve the management uh, effectiveness is a key uh, task for the for Chan. So um, when the greenest uh, um, criteria uh, introduced to China, and, uh, this, the, the key goals for uh, to, uh, to enhance and maintain the effectiveness of uh, uh, protected area and uh, uh, especially for uh, protected area sustainable development. Uh, this is a, a requirement of uh, conservation on biodiversity and uh, a global consensus. So China adopted the IUCN Green List uh, criteria to effectively measure the management effectiveness of protected area in according with the international standards and provided the international coordination for the effective uh, live of protected area. So the, the basic uh, uh, processes is according to uh, the IUCN uh, 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 standard. And so, formation the ego, ego workshop to discuss the uh, uh, criteria and the indicators, and uh, also adaptations of the indicators one by one, and how to understand the uh, uh, meaning to fit the national context and also uh, training the egos and uh, uh, training the egos exp from protected area were willing to participate the IUCN Green District Protected Area and also ego uh, exports traveling to such cities and check the check if the PA that is meeting the standards of uh, GLPA. And now six uh, cities has already achieved the stand, standards in, uh, in the first uh, the, 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 uh, list. And uh, 
six project area in the processes. No, this is uh, you know 40, 14, uh, 2014 and uh, six pro, uh, protected areas is uh, imported uh, listed in the GLPA and then Tangjiahe, Tangqing, uh, Estuary, Dongtianak, the Fangshan, Wudanichi, and the Nongwan. So, so some um, very important activities. I think is the, the first important is the training for the uh, GLPA uh, applicants and uh, included uh, two or three uh, group training for uh, GLPA applicants and uh, one then one by one discussion for all GLPA applicants, especially for the uh, protocol protected the value for each uh, protected area. And what is the key threes in the uh, how to uh, assessment the assess, assess the uh, PA conservation actions and uh, give some best practices of PA management uh, activities. And uh, especially for successful successful conservation story for core value uh, uh, conservation. And there's some uh, experience and the lessons in China application processes. So uh, and the whole tutorial to 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 a good story is uh, up to the standards is a very important uh, aspect. And what is the biggest practice? The what information can probably that you are up to the uh, standards and uh, what is the gaps to, to the uh, uh, GLPA standards and how to improve is a, well, is a very important uh, aspect. Uh, where is your innovation and how to flow it? So this is a, a need to uh, talk to one by one uh, GLPA application. And also something, uh, sometimes a lack of uh, some kind of information so, included a uh, stakeholder participated and the women uh, involved and, uh, and ways uh, related to complaints and, uh, and uh, need some this kind of information. And this, uh, before the uh, in the in the process of uh, uh, training for GA applications, uh, we need to identify what is the what are the core protection values and the objectives, and what is the three to core values, and how to monitor and the response to those those threes, and. Uh, uh, Social and economic impacts of protection and management, and the stakeholder and uh, need, need to uh, uh, one questions by one question by a question. So this is uh, uh, about the some uh, criteria. What is management uh, good? What is a good management, and and uh, how to lead to innovate and uh, management. Uh, Concept and the protagonists of a protected area. So this this uh, this is some uh, uh, important aspect that need to explain to the GLPA application application. And then in the um, this is some uh, process of using the standard at a set level and. Uh, Need to tra tra uh, training and uh, uh, preparation of staff, staff and uh, self assessment uh, against the, the standard and the trade, uh, and uh, uh, identify information and uh, management uh, cap, cap uh, to uh, 
uh, to the um, standards and the development and the Im uh, implementation of action plan and the prepare the document in the cooperation with ego to fail the check. And uh, we then uh, use the Shenlongjia National Park uh, as an example to uh, show the uh, using the standard at its 30 levels. Uh, now, uh, Shenlongjia National Park is uh, a pilot, pilot uh, uh, national park pilot area, uh, and uh, we combine six uh, protected area into one uh, uh, national park. And from about this is uh, in Hubei province, and uh, uh, about uh, 1,170 square kilometers. Have many kind of uh, vegetation zones from the uh, evergreen deciduous broad broad level mixed forest in the north hemisphere and the completely wide vegetation spectrum of the of the uh, North subtropical mountains, and it has has a special ecological and a cultural value. Uh, have three, now that the Shenlongjia has three international brands of UNESCO World Natural uh, Heritage, World Biosphere Resource, and World Geopark, and also is a uh, listed in the uh, uh, international important uh, wetland, and it is uh, so uh, uh, rich in biodiversity and uh, uh, geological uh, um, uh, uh, record. And uh, this is also have a uh, uh, about uh, two, um, 320 personnel in the national park. And uh, uh, responsible for natural resource protection, scientific research, uh, sense uh, uh, popularization and education, ecotourism and the community co-management. And during the Pilot activities of Shenlongjia National Park have completed the established of instruction, legislation, system construction, policy platform construction, scientific research platform construction, and the natural resource inventory the franchise and the tourism activity management this have make some special plans for protection, scientific research and the community development uh, have been formulated. The National Park uh, have made some uh, natural threats, the for, such as a for, forest fire, uh, the terrain, uh, extremely uh, climate events, and uh, uh, the biological invasions, and also uh, some uh, pieces, uh, forest pieces. Human distribution did disturb uh, uh, about the national park is a forming uh, uh, land recommendation, grazing, firewood collection, and the me medicine collecting, and, and the, the, by the local uh, community uh, resident. 
and the in, in, infrastructure construction of road, water support, and, and so on, and also uh, ecotourism activities. Uh, it's uh, an important uh, uh, report. Also, uh, have some uh, management problem about uh, this is some uh, important some photos. This is Da Jiu Hu wetland, and this is a tower tree, and a golden monkey is a very important uh, conservation goal. And about the benefit and the challenge. Uh, okay. And, uh, okay. Uh, this is the uh, through the uh, GRPA application, the national park can understand the, the gap between them. Uh, the their uh, management cities and uh, the national uh, requirement, national good uh, management uh, uh, levels. So, so uh, they are try to uh, collect some uh, uh, information and uh, make some decision and to improve their uh, management. Uh, five uh, the lessons uh, learned uh, need, need to uh, to improve the trans policy of management uh, effectiveness and the invert uh, stakeholders to participate in management uh, and uh, uh, protect. Uh, 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 and the second is necessary for the understand the ecological and the cultural value and the risks of uh, protected area. The focus on the objective of ecosystem and the biodiversity and the cultural um, uh, protection. Uh, and the recommendations that I would uh, like to share with other countries. And uh, uh, one is carry out uh, uh, effective traveling. And the second is uh, according to the goal orientation and the problem orientation. Uh, any size the exactly problem. The uh, three is a uh, uh, evaluate the effectiveness of uh, protection and uh, timely modify and improve the uh, protection strategy. And the stakeholders are encouraged to take positive measures to for the man management and uh, in the design and the effective evaluation of protected areas. The government should uh, refer to this trend. Okay. The summary, um, uh, uh, IUCN GLPA standard localization is a key step to cover out the GLPA certification. And uh, it is an effective way to promote the uh, the GLPA application and in the uh, processing of airplane uh, for IUCN Greenlist, Shenandoah National Park prepare relative supporting materials and, uh, and uh, fund the gifts, uh, management uh, gifts. And the Shenandoah National Park uh, meet the requirement of uh, IUCN Greenlist for good governance. And uh, design something. Uh, uh, okay, this is a. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Lee, for that very comprehensive and uh, and detailed overview of the green list in China, and also the case study from Shinoja National Park. Uh, I'm sorry that there's wasn't sufficient time to really go into all the the detail that you had in your slides, but we will share the presentation afterwards uh, and people will be able to, to read through the slides at their, at their leisure and uh, take on board the, the, the full detail that you've presented. 
We perhaps have time for just one question. If there are, uh, if any have come in, I'm looking at Alex. Uh, if not, if, since time is a bit short, uh, perhaps we'll move on to the, the next case study from Malaysia. Thank you again, Professor Lee. We really appreciate you taking the time. And let me, uh, let me move to Malaysia uh, and invite uh, Ms. Yeo Bi Hong, who's the chair of the Malaysia Eagle, and also Dr. Achyur Chung from the Sugud Islands Marine Conservation Area in Sabah uh, to talk about their green list experience in uh, Sabah, Malaysia. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much uh, for this opportunity for us to share the learnings and experiences in Malaysia. Um, I will just give a very brief sharing about um, green list implementation at the Malaysia level, and I will pass it to Archie, who will be talking more about the hands-on experience uh, implementing green list at the site level. So. Um, we will give you an idea of our the process that we took and basically to answer the question why why Malaysia uh, adopted the green list and what was the process that we took to adopt uh, the program. Um, basically, Malaysia has been um, using the various tools for measuring effectiveness of protected and conserved areas and um, WWF Malaysia found out about Green List uh, back in 2015, and they were very interested to find out how the program could motivate and um, have that vision for different stakeholders to be able to come together and uh, have the ownership to work and build a system that could bring some transformation or uh, continuous improvement uh, to the protected area management in the country. And hence, therefore, uh, there were three kind of uh, process that Malaysia went through from 2015 to 2017. It was uh, quite a process of uh, finding out more. And also IUCN provided a lot of support. They came over to Malaysia and they organized a few uh, introductory sessions on green list and engaging various protected areas management agencies. And from there, uh, we got our first batch of Malaysian Eagles trained and formalized in October 2017. Uh, we were, uh, the, the first batch was uh, selected by the WCPA uh, regional vice chair. And since that, since the first, um, first um, group that was selected uh, on this day, we immediately worked on adapting the standards and um, we took about six to seven months to go through the standards, all the stand, um, indicators and verification and adapted it to the Malaysian um, jurisdiction. And with that, we also uh, translated the standards into Bahasa Malayu, which is the national language, so that uh, Green List could be more extensive and reach out to different parts of Malaysia. And with that, we also organized our stakeholder consultation process, and we divided it into two types of stakeholders. The first group were the key stakeholders that we wanted to meet face-to-face -face and explain Green List, which covered the three regions in Malaysia, Sabah, Sarawak, and Peninsula Malaysia. And at the same time, we thought that it would be also important to reach out to local and indigenous communities uh, at a more simpler level to explain what Green List is all about. And if they had any uh, feedback uh, in terms of the standards that we could therefore include in our adaptation. And besides that, we also uh, announced the adapted standards and online for, and for 60 days to invite feedback for stakeholders we could not meet during that time. Um, after the whole process, we had an opportunity to, uh, after that the Green List Committee endorsed the Malaysian Adapted Standards, we had the opportunity to present it at a regional conference so that we could further share about our Green List experience to uh, the practitioners in the region. Um, so, with that, we continuously had uh, IUCN, uh, uh, Dave and uh, Matt, they were uh, undertaking trainings for us, for the Eagles, and also to the site as well. So we had also a workshop on um, 
um, integrated green list assessment and site survey workshop back in 2019. Uh, fast forward, we are now in more or less our third phase. So we added a few more eagles to the group and we have our second round uh, of our second chair now. And we realized that um, we have a lot of positive things that we could learn from the global program. At the same time, there were opportunities to be more specific in terms of how it could work efficiently at the Malaysian level. And hence, we had also adopted a Malaysian Green List uh, Eagle Handbook. And um, as what Dave mentioned just now, um, our third phase, we were very much looking into developing um, the mentors uh, who could provide more direct contact and support to the sites. As, as assessors, we are not able to provide that direct uh, advice. So we are now uh, uh, trying to develop our mentor program. And we had a call of expression of interest. Um, and we had uh, our first mentor training in February uh, uh, 2021 with 22 particip participants. Just a very quick um, overview of the Eagle Mentor Group. Uh, Eagle Group, we basically have 12 members on our team and we have our implementing partner, WWF, as, who acts as a secretariat. And so we come from a very diverse group of social, legal, economics, protected areas, marine and terrestrial backgrounds. It's very uh, helpful in a sense because when we go through the standards, we can rely on each other for their expertise uh, to share their experience and see whether we, can, we are rigorous enough in uh, assessing whether the, stand, uh, the, the sites meet the standards. And uh, just quickly, just to give you an idea, we, are, we now have five sites uh, who have registered on the Green List program and a few more sites are interested. Uh, just this to share the list of uh, sites that are on the Green List program in Malaysia at the moment. Thank you for your attention. I'll now pass uh, uh, the presentation to Archie to take over. Thank you. Archie, over to you. Um, thank you, Bihong. Um, I've just on my camera for a while and after that I'm going to turn it off. So, okay. Um, uh, I, shall, I shall do a, a short introduction myself. Um, I'm the lead marine biologist for reef guardians that have been managed the Sugut Island Marine Conservation Areas that we call the Simka here for the past 16 years. I was the Eagle member for Malaysia from 2018 to 2020. But because of SIMCA is potentially to be a green listed, so to avoid the conflict of interest of, of being an Eagle members and a, the application side, so I withdraw myself from the Eagle membership and become a mentor for SIMCA for, or Reef Guardian for the green list applications. So a bit of introductions. Uh, of Simca. So Simca, Sugut Island Marine Conservation Area is the first privately managed uh, MPA in Malaysia. So it was uh, gazetted in 2001 under provision of the Sabah Wildlife at Nangman 1997. It is a joint management and collaborations with the Sabah Wildlife Departments and is, is the IUCN cat, cat, Category 2 protected area, which is uh, for the biodiversity conservation for education and recreational purposes. The lease is 30 years between Reef Guardians and the state of uh, government Sabah. And Reef Guardian have been giving full mandate to conserve and manage the activity within the Simca. Geologically, um, Simca located in the Sulu Sea. Uh, can we go to the next slide, Bihong? Okay, so this is this is a map. Uh, the left is a Google map, and the detail maps on, on the right. Um, Simka located in the Sulu Sea, the northeastern side of the Sabah Borneo. So that's uh, so Simka is about eighty kilometers from the mainland from Sandakan Town. The size of the Simka is about forty six thousand three hundred seventeen hectares. It consists of three islands which is Bangkayan, Bilian, the Gaipil Islands. And uh, Simka is located within the Coral Triangle Initiative area. 
the CTI, if you if you know about that, is the multilateral partnership of the six countries that working together to sustain marine and coastal resources by addressing issues on food security, climate change, and marine biodiversity. Uh, Bihong, can we uh, go back to the to the uh, no the second one? Up, oh, okay, okay, okay. So. The three islands, the site value, the three islands of Simca are important foraging and nesting ground for the two species of uh, sea turtles, which, it, which are uh, green and hawksbill turtles. Last year, um, our team records uh, a video sighting of leatherback turtles that are not very far from the islands. So the presence of these three species adding significant values to the, to the site. Furthermore, uh, the surrounding areas are healthy coral reef and seagrass habitats, which are important nursing ground for many important marine species. Additionally, Lankayan also reported the spawning aggregations for the coral trout uh, in 2012. I myself reporting the uh, Simca may contain higher coral trout abundance in compared to other sites in Malaysia. So with the healthy coral reef habitats, Reef Guardian in collaboration with the Local university published a paper on so the coral spawning in Langkayan just recently. So the record of the corresponding events with the conservations within the conservation area demonstrate the importance of the coral seedling area for the long-term recruitment of coral colony to the sur surrounding surrounding sea. After that, then in the man managing tracks, so Reef Guardian identified tracks listed here are illegal fishing pollutions and also the climate change issue. So illegal fishing are, for example, fish bombings and sodium cyanide fishing and bottom trailings, trawling, sorry. So Reef Guardian have it on enforcement team that's trained and certified as a Saba wildlife, Saba ordinary wildlife wardens to stop and detain illegal fishing boat within the uh, um, MPA. So to assist the enforcement work, we even, the Reef Guardian even setting up an enforcement steering committee with the Malaysian enforcement agencies such as Malin Police to combat on this illegal fishing activity within these conservation areas. For the second track is the, oh no, okay. For the second track is the pollutions, especially the sedimentations and river runoff problems for the mainland. So, uh, from the experience is that in 2007, there was a seven days continuous rain on the mainland that result on the river waters or river runoff that reaching the shallow reef in Langkayan. The river which is about 26 kilometers from, from the island. So during that event, the freshwater kill corals and embedded rats up to four meters to the reef. It result reduced in life coral cover to less than 10% at the affected strip. Next, please. Next again. Oh no, sorry, I forgot the third track. Okay, the third track, which is linked to the second track, which is the, with the climate change issue, which affecting rainfall. Uh, we increase the rain, air temperature and sea temperature that result mass coral breaching and reduce and life coral covers and cause ecosystem collapse. So, okay, sorry, Beihong. So we can go to the next slide. So what the reason why Simca is selected for the uh, select for the IUC and Green List standards are, I think that's that's the way to de demonstrate management and conservation's outcome for the past 20 years. Secondly, that we are using that for identif identifications of gaps and solution for, for the management effectiveness. And then thirdly, to achieve the green list is, I think, is to demonstrate excellency in the work that we do. And in the process of application for IUCN green list for Simca, Swift Guardian started the IUCN green list in the mid 2019 by partic participations in the stakeholder consultations. So, the application of green list for Swift Guardian is a two, it's a two main work actually. So beside me, there is a Davis, a senior uh, marine biologist for Reef Guardians. After he attended the stakeholders consult consultation from the Malaysian Seagull. So we went through the process for the surf assessing assessments against standards. And then after the gap analysis, 
And then after that, we indicate the interest to be the applicants. Then we prepare preparations of the green list documents. And um, because of the only the two men work, it took us almost a year to get into the current candidate phase. So we are we are currently in the stage of preparation for the panel panorama solutions and site value before we jump into the next stage for site evaluation by the eagle member. Okay, next please. As for the benefits of using IUCN green list standard, I think that standard is a very systematic guide for the MPA effectiveness from that from components from a good governance, a sound design, effective management that lead to conservation outcome. So before the green list standard, I think Rift Guardian have been using a guidebook that we call how is your MPA doing? I think, I think that's published by IUCN too. So we evaluate uh, using that tool for, for management effectiveness. The assessment was done in 2008 and 2015 with the interval of five years. For that assessment, gap, or, gap was were identified and we produced a five-year action plan um, to guide operation and management effectiveness of, uh, of Simca. As for the challenges of using this um, standard is that um, the resources, the first one is the resources is a, is a challenge that I mentioned earlier, the whole process from the beginning is until today is a two, two main job. So there's no extra fund to support these, uh, these applications. So we have to do it, doing it during our free time. And after that, secondly, our experience is that um, the te terminology in that standard can be confusing for maybe for non-scientists or for example ecosystem values or ecosystem services and nature value can that, that the kind of term can be confusing and the third challenges is the preparations of the document for the candidates submissions candidate first submission some of the, the some of the document for example the proof of meetings of the minutes that back that before 2001 could not be found and uh, the fourth challenge is the, to demonstrate conservation outcome. Giving an example here is that is like the, um, the percentage of light coral carbons that's supposed to show um, improvement over decades of conservation e efforts. But however, because of the climate change, for example, the percentage of the coral carbon decrease. And the, the fifth challenges here is, I think that's a challenges that everybody facing right now with the COVID-19 on the financing on MPA. So this uh, COVID impact the normal activities affecting tourism activities that result in reductions of the revenues and resources to, to fund PA operations. Um, Bihal, next. Okay, as a, as a lesson learned, we personally think that to achieve management and conservation outcome, it requires a great efforts of a team that highly dedicates, um, highly dedicates personnel from the man managers to the few workers and the cross collaboration and engagement with the stakeholders are, are important to make this, uh, make this work. As for the recommendations for the potential PA or CA for the green list applications, the surf assessment and gap analysis are important to assess if they are conservation outcome. For example, here, the newly established PA or MPA that have yet shown any conservation outcome. I did identify site, is, uh, site value is equally important having a baseline or threshold data to support the conservation outcome. It is recommended that's also, if it needed a point, a mentor, so two, if, if needed. Lastly, I think that um, the recommendation is keep sipping, uh, seeking help from the eagle members. I seek help from eagle members very quite often. So next one. So as a summary, there's an article that we recently, um, that, the, that recently published on 18th of March by the Commonwealth 
Charter. So this article summarized the two MPA candidates, a Malaysian MPA candidates for the IUC and Green List. The link is there in, in, this, uh, in this slide. So the two MPA, which are the Sugut Island Land Conservation Area and also the Tun Mustafa Park. So I would like to end my, my student presentation and thank you. Great, thank you very much to, to both of you for that uh, really informative uh, presentation and for a, a summary of the process in, uh, in Malaysia and in, in Sabah. And of course, we wish you uh, every success with the uh, continued journey and uh, hope that your site, uh, Sugut Islands, will be, will be green listed very, very soon. I don't think any questions have come in and I can see that we're pretty much uh, spot on time. Uh, so why don't we take a, a 10 minute break now? I encourage you just to, to stay uh, online. Uh, we will also show a short video during the, the break. Uh, so if you're not desperate for a cup of tea or uh, a comfort break, please uh, stick around to watch the video. It's only four and a half minutes long, but it's a rather uh, nice story about a uh, green listed site in, uh, in Lebanon. Otherwise, uh, please try to join us again at uh, in basically in 10 minutes uh, at uh, 10 minutes to four uh, Bangkok time. Okay, and can we show the video? Okay, thanks. الشوف طبيعية هي من أكبر المحميات الطبيعية بلبنان صارت مع ال 22 ضيعة المحيطين فيها محمية محيط حيوي دورة الأساسي حماية النظام الإيكولوجي الذي يتميز بغابات الأرز واللي بتحتوي بداخلها 30% من غابات الأرز المتبقي في لبنان القائمة الأخضراء هي مقياس دولي وضعته الاتحاد الدولي لصون الطبيعة لتقييم الإدارة الفعالة للمحميات الطبيعية الهدف الأساسي كان من أرز الشوف أنه تتقدم على الجرين ليست لنتأكد أنه نحن إدارتنا فعالة إدارتنا عم تلعب دورة بحماية هالنظم الإيكولوجية وعم تلعب دورة بهالتفاعل اللي لازم يكون بين المحميات وكل المجتمعات المحلية الموجودة حولها الاتحاد شكل مجموعات من الخبراء بكل منطقة من مناطق العالم نسميهم إحنا الإيجل جروب ومنطقة بأن هي تقيم الملفات بتاع الترشح بتاع المحميات أول مرحلة كانت مرحلة السلف أسسمنت أو التقييم الذاتي كل مؤشر كان لازم نبرهن أنه هيدا المؤشر نحن مطابق لأعمال المحمية حطينا وثائق وكلها صارت على الموقع الكومباس في حوالي 200 وثيقة بتبرهن أنه المحمية هي بتطابق كل هالمعايير هيدولة هذا كله صار بالتعاون مع المرشد سياري لفاف وساعدنا ببعض الأشياء اللي ما كانت واضحة عملنا استمارة عن مواضيع بتخص المحمية أهم الحوكمة الحماية التواصل والشكاوى وغيرها هذه الاستمارة حطيناها أونلاين على الويب سايت المحمية وكمان حطينا الكيو ار كود على المداخل المحمية الأربع مداخل بإمكان الزوار يلي هن كمان ستيك هولدرز بمجرد ما إنه يشوفوا هذا الكيو ار كود بتاخذهم على الرابط يلي هو على الاستمارة قامة المحمية محمية أرز الشوف بتجربة كتير مهمة مع الأفريقاء اللي بتعاطوا يوميا مع المحمية اللي هي بسميها وورد كافي وهي بتقضي انه الافريقاء يكونوا موزعين على طاولات مختلفه وكل طاوله في عليها ميسر محضرين نحن اكيد الاسئله نحن حاليا بمرحله التقييم الميداني استقبلنا خبيرين من الايجل ممبرز بالمنطقه 
احنا درسنا الملف كامل في في بلدنا كل واحد في مكانه والهدف ان احنا نيجي نشوف على الارض الواقع ما يثبت الدوكيومنتس اللي اتقدمت بعد ثلاث ايام بدنا نلتقي مع اصحاب المصلحه او ذوي العلاقه اللي بتشتغل معهم المحميه البلديات المزارعين السيدات اللي هن ناشطين جدا باداره برنامج التنميه الريفيه اصحاب الخدمات بالاضافه الى اللي في شويه تضارب باستخدام الاراضي بيننا وبينهم التقينا كمان بفريق عمل المحميه وبالباحثين اللي هن عم يشتغلوا على الامور العلميه بالمحميه من من خلال القيمه الخضراء جو في حافز ان هو يشجع المحميات او الدول نفسها ان هي تقدم وتبع على القيمه الخضراء وبالنسبه لمحميه درج الشوف نحن رح نضل عم نشتغل اكثر ما فينا لنضل ضمن هذا المستوى لنكون دائما مندرجين ضمن الجرين ليست Great. Well, I hope you enjoyed the video, and uh, we'll start the webinar again in uh, in just a minute or two. So. Great. Well, welcome back, everyone. And uh, we'll continue now with the case study presentations. Uh, our next uh, presentation, we'll look at the experience of the Republic of Korea, which was also uh, an early adopter of the Green List standard, one of the, uh, the pioneers of the standard, and uh, also has some very uh, rich experience to, to share with us. Uh, so if I could invite Dr. Ha Gyeong Heo, who's a senior research fellow with the Korea National Park Service uh, to give his presentation. And I believe we'll, we'll control the slides uh, from here. So just let us know uh, when you would like to change the slides and we'll be happy to do that for you from, from here. Thank you very much for your introduction. So I'm Ha Gyeong Ho from Korea National Park Service. 
and I'm currently working for Research Institute as a general manager of policy development division. So many thanks, Scott and Mr. Ko, to organize this seminar, web seminar, and some presenters, presenters and colleagues from Marshall Reason. So it's a very honor and pleased to provide our case studies. So, so, to, so let me start with um, my introduction of the national parks. So next slide. Today, I will try to introduce our case study divided into two parts, the pilot phrase experience and re-listing phrase experience. Next. So let me start with a brief introduction of the national parks. So national parks have generally nationally Representative the ecosystem and natural and cultural landscapes, and we we aim to manage it soundly conserve and sustainable use. Next, so there are twenty two national parks in Korea. The name of the number of ID is the is the designation order. The, the blue blue one is the green list site. Next. As a management authority of national parks, Korean National Park Service established in 1987. And the KMPS has four, four main strategic targets, nature conservation and beneficiary and safe national parks and the sustainable management system. Next. I borrow this slide from the site summary, which developed using the ICN Greenlist Committee. So Jirisan is the first national park and largest national parks in Korea. And more than 5,400 species, animal species inhabiting Jirisan National Park. Next. And Seraksan National Park is the center of the Korean Peninsula and middle of the Korea axis, axis known as the back to Dekan axis, and also the first biosphere reserve area in Korea. Next slide. The Osei-san National Park is the, the designated as the 11th national park in Korea, and is designated in 1975. And right side the picture is the four forest, four forest and the, and the uh, approach trail in Odessa National Park. Next. So previously I uh, presented the APAP technical workshop before, so I briefly introduced it. So this slide showed uh, why did KMPS decide to adopt the ICN green list. So, so previously we tried to try to get more more better management in national Korean national park. So we adopt the uh, adopted Asian category systems and conducted management effectiveness evaluation. And now we just uh, find out some some good global standard to manage national parks. So we we think the Asian greenness could provide a direction for effective management of national parks and uh, so as a management agency, KMPS needs to prove our achievement. So I, I think Greenlist could, could be the better way to, to, to prove the performance of KMPS. And we, we try to more attention from stakeholders and publics or beyond the national jurisdiction. So I mean the globally on the, 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 our national parks. Next. This is our process at the, the pilot, pilot place. So, so campus engaged in Green List initiative from the very, very, very first stage. So we conclude the MOU with IUCN the, the, regarding Green List in 20, 12, so at, during the World Conservation Congress in Jeju. And then we organized some national expert assessment groups and uh, 
an intonation orientation octave, etc. And next slide. This slide shows the, the, the series of the meetings to implement the greenness in Korea. So we got a, some, some expert meeting with including the foreign experts and make some site, site managers meetings. Next slide. And this one, some, some of you might yeah, attend this meeting. So in the World Park Congress in Sydney, 2014 is a certification. Next. We organized first uh, Korea Eagle Group, so from, from University and Research Institute and NGOs. So it's men, so composed of seven people. So the seven men that at that, that time we didn't achieve the gender balance. Next. So this is the, the, the releasing place experiences. So after long silence preparation period, we, so, so we reorganized, officially reorganized ICN Eagle groups in Korea. So totally nine members, including two female members. And just October, so we started often, often the orientation workshop for Eagle members and the site managers. And uh, the 19th December to 20 February, we unloading the first contents at the confess for three green site. And then the, the, the last February, we reviewed the first review from Eagle members to the content, contents of the confess. And we have uh, some small legal group meetings and some the lo local managers uh, complement the contents of the compass. And then we make some made uh, the, the site visit plans. Next slide. Then we have uh, the, the meetings, so uh, eagle meetings to decide to decide uh, how to conduct the uh, field missions and uh, the review the current progress. So we, the Eagle member decided to conduct a site visit even in period of the COVID-19. So we made some simple field survey checklist and using this checklist, there's one or two Eagle members participated in the site visit. And we have two decision making meetings and then the last, last force. So the Iceland Greenness Committee meeting was held. Next. So this slide is uh, how to the, the reorganize the Eagle group. So, uh, so through, through the three weeks, for three weeks uh, open call with totally 13 people applied and then nine members is uh, decided to be the Eagle members. With four new members, two, two members resigned of the first first Eagle Group member, and we try to get the gender balance and the generation balance. Next, so after reorganizing the Eagle Eagle Group, so we had a, the orientation workshop to get familiar with the IUCN indicators and global standards. So the Eagle Group members and the local steps and, and IUCN reviewer and DBR they attended this meeting. So two days, so two days workshop. So at the time we tried to provide some ex explanation on IUCN greenness and we discussed it, how to implement it properly in Korea. So we, we have a discussion to, to find out adapted indicators and, and how to use the comp compass properly. Next. So we discussed to, to, to the, how to adapt this indicator. As you know, well, the general indicators are, I think, so are well generalized to implement almost every countries 
without big change. So Eagle, Eagle, at that time, Eagle Group members didn't feel too much change. We don't need much change it. So instead of developing new adapted indicators, the Eagle Group decided to reflect Korean context through adding some verification method rather than make some new, new adapted indicators. So we, we discussed the directed consideration, consideration notes. And so how to use, uh, we already got evidence info, information. So we decided to utilizing outcome indexes already developed by KMPS, such as ecosystem health index, stress index, et cetera. Next slide. So, we tried to working with the research institute and the local office together. That because of the we try to reduce the burden of the local site managers. So the left side is to make the long term plan, implementing plan of green ice and greenness in Korea, and right side the report is the how to implement it. It three three candidate sites. I mean the three national parks. I think that this process was very useful to reduce the, the burdens and the extra works of the local managers might be caused to implementing green list. Next. And we conduct a site visit with one of two, one or two Eagle members attended. And the, during September, we did, did the site visit at and it's a five, five or six members the, the, the contributed to make the checklist and the review the whole compass content contents. During the site visit, we we make a, made a chance to to meet the, the, the local steps and the communicate with the stakeholders, various stakeholders for one day for, for each national parks. Next. So the September 28th, we had a preparation meeting for to the, the final review, the progress of the complex contents. And then the 29th, we had a decision-making meeting with the review, IUCN reviewers. The, the, we communicate with the, the, with the reviewers focusing on the process and some contents and the final check the field mission report and the compass content. And we made a decision based on consensus. And next slide. So, so the, the pilot phrase and the, the release deal listing phrase is, has also some challenges. So one of major challenges we need to, to expand the Eagle groups for enabling to cover various fields. And, and we have faced, again, the lack of common understanding on the ice and green standard, the, the, the local managers and, and local stakeholders. And we need to proper communication with the various stakeholders. And so, so some of the local managers still feel the ice and green implementation is the extra may cause that may might cause the extra works for them. So they worried about that. So and the, some the inadequate information and document to to verify the, our achievement and how to implementing global greenness standard into national management systems. That's our challenges and considerations. Next slide. So in order to effective implementation of the, the implementation in Korea, that so one of the key question is to how to green this standard embedded in properly into the national system naturally. So without the, the extra works. So, so we saw the, our national system. So according to Natural Parks Act. So we, every five year, we need to conduct a resource survey and management effectiveness evaluation. Then based on this information, we 
develop the conservation management plan. So some of office might, so might develop implementing plan every year. And then every five year or 10 year cycle, we made a new conservation management plan. So this is a five year cycle nationally, according to in line with the Natural Park Act. So, so let's see the IUCN Green site. It's a five year certification duration. So it's the same. So the, the, the nationally MEE result is to provide self-assessment and we can, we might find out some information to make GL dossiers. So, so the stakeholders and the eagle members contribute to their to provide their comments. So we modify and finalize the sales of assessment and site summary. Then we, in cooperation with eagle and the IUCN reviewers, and we make the IUCN greenness every five year cycles. So, so the, the our main key question is how to implementing it properly is combined together. So next slide. This slide is shows that uh, we made these the tables to uh, that very initial draft plan. So, so after after resource resource survey and management effectiveness evaluation, then after this, based on this. Is every five year, so we made this cycle. So, this using this information, we try to make uh, the legist uh, I think greenness uh, time properly. So, this table showed the twenty six. We made it all national parks to be to be greenness site. This is option one. Next slide. So option two, it says uh, plan two is to the, the, the most, most of national parks is uh, management is approach is similar. It's uh, the focusing headquarters principles. So we find out some representative sites uh, by national park types, such as mountain, mount, mountainous national park, marine and coastal, historic or, or urban parks. So we may, find out some representative areas. So we made a, make a Asian greenness site that managed the totally poor site. So this, this, is show, this table showed how to, how to make the, all types of national park to be Asian greenness site. This is option two. This, this next slide. So, so I think the Asian greenness provide the blueprint on how to manage the protected area well. So, so, so we try to find out a way, naturally implement greenness in, in line with national context. So thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Ha Yong Hao for that uh, presentation. And it's really encouraging to see how much progress you've been able to make despite uh, COVID-19. But also I think it's very interesting to see how you are trying to integrate the green list into the institutional processes of the Korea National Park Service. Uh, with one of the aims being, as you said, to reduce the workload on the site managers and just make this part of their their day-to-day -day and uh, annual work. So I think that's a, a really interesting case study. Uh, I'm just looking at Alex to see if any questions have come in. Uh, no questions as yet. So in that case, uh, I suggest we carry on with our final uh, case study, which is from Vietnam. Uh, as I mentioned in my introductory remarks, uh, Vietnam has just recently had a site added to the green list, making it the first country in Southeast Asia to, to have an IUCN green listed site. So I'd like to hand over now to uh, Mr. Tu and Nguyen Duc from IUCN Vietnam, who will give a joint presentation together with uh, Mr. Vai, Mr. Mai Van Nguyen, who's the director of the Van Long Wetland Nature Reserve. Uh, so Tu, over to you. Hello everyone, thanks God for letting and organizers for letting me present this. 
Uh, so sorry that I don't know, maybe it's the technical reason. So Mr. Quyen, who uh, prepares his presentation with me, is not available in the Zoom. So on behalf of him and really team in Vietnam, I will prepare this. <clears throat> yeah, so here's the content. I'll go to the first slide. So process of adopting is not really standard at national level. But Vietnam is some of first country in Southeast Asia commit with the uh, brilliant mm, uh, program uh, back to the UNPAC Congress in Sydney 2014. And uh, in, uh, one year later, uh, Vien, uh, Vien Forest, the uh, um, uh, Protected area agencies in Vietnam uh, issue a letter and, uh, to to help that. Uh, uh, after that, uh, we take uh, we uh, took some step. Now, uh, uh, first of all, uh, established uh, an ego. Of course, it takes time. You have to uh, advertisement go for interest. Uh, you have screening process, you have um, uh, reviewer and vice chair of regional uh, protected areas committee involved. Then in April 2017, the Vietnam Eagle was established with early with 13 members. Um, and yeah, the picture uh, is a training workshop for Eagle at the time. Uh, uh, met by Dev yes, today and Matt at the time with the reviewer assigned for Vietnam. Uh, similar to other, we, had, uh, we need to adapt the indicators and in, it takes few months. In fact, in Vietnam, we did not adapt anything, just uh, we uh, called the chan, uh, ch translation note to, to understand the language of indicator in our context, other than, you know, adapt with them. Uh, at the time, Foresight committed to Eagle standard. Uh, first, they is for long wetland nature reserves in the north of Vietnam. That being a snowpack and cool down a snowpack in south of Vietnam and Pumat a snowpack in center of Vietnam. Yeah, and the picture the by Dow, the Eagle members of Vietnam at the time. Uh, we have two we have two co chairs of the Eagle member to ensure they only you know be there to make decisions. Uh, So why Vietnam interest in uh, in Billis? I think uh, the protected area agency should uh, address this question. However, from what we discussed and from my views, uh, first of all, like every other uh, government of Vietnam, I stop a list a system of protected areas in Vietnam with special use forest systems. And they need to manage that. They need to govern it in a good way to ensure the effectiveness of the system to convert our biodiversity. So we need a system in hand to evaluate our um, uh, our sister, our protected area system. And we try with different things. We have reporting requirement and things like that. And it changed on the time. And it's quite time consuming and also resource consuming to, uh, to, to, to do it. So why don't we accept, the simply accept, uh, widely, internationally accepted sets of standards for the job. Also, yeah, I borrow this slides from my colleague's friend, uh, James Hart Cattles, uh, 
you know, like many other countries in the world, many nations in the world, we love footballs. So if we want to join with the international community, we want to send our protected area team to the World Cup of Protected Area. We need to be, uh, we need to have good governance. So that what we need, we need a fairy. We need to fair place, a fairly played. We need level playing fields. And finally, we need to achieve our important goals. So it's simply to explain why Vietnam interests in uh, real estate. Yeah, and now to go to the first really side of Vietnam uh, backgrounds, too many questions. Uh, uh, Vân Long was established in 2001 for 20 years now. It's a very small area of uh, 2,700 hectares, something, and 70% of the area is the Lamstow Mountains, and 25% is the Wolverine. Larius were famous for our uh, um, endemic primate species, the Lacalangas, and it support the largest population of that species in the world. And yeah, the managers and also our Vietnamese are proud about that. Uh, it's also provide very important habitats for uh, many water birds. Uh, in addition, it's very important for local livelihoods as provide ecological services and processes to support local livelihoods. And the science also have uh, control values together with that. So that uh, the governments of Vietnam, uh, um, Gazette is that science, a uh, nature reserve in 2001, and it recognized at Ramsar site in 2017. Here's a map of the site, and the blue is the color is the uh, lambstone cut. It's very important for the Lakalanga. However, that site is situated in the northern plains of, uh, of Vietnam and surrounded by many other cast hills that heavily exploited but for you know cement industries. So the size is very important, however, under threats and pressures from economic development. Yeah, some picture on the long, you see the Lacalangas were beautiful species, and the wetlands is that so it's that's beautiful sand rings, you know, provide services only for um uh, agricultural production as well, so for tourism development. So proceed uh, to uh, uh, list uh, to, to list a slide uh, at site level. Uh, but uh, first of all, the site commit with the uh, relief programs and. Uh, you know that's for really standard. It has some 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 phases of uh, 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 revolutions. Uh, first of all, when we do the assessment, it the uh, uh, standard uh, version uh, uh, one point zero, and now it changed to one uh, to one point one, uh, with maybe two more in the uh, indicators. After the self assessment, they identify the gaps, what the sign need to, to fill the gap to meet on the release indicator. And we together uh, implementing partner and the sign managers with the support from mentor, we discuss how to fill the gap. For example, um, to fill the gap of, you know, uh, Information disclosures in uh, decisions and decision making process. It's very simple. We have the 
uh, cyborgs everywhere uh, on which all, uh, what all low, what you know forbidden in the site and have a public website so every people can access the, the legislation relating to protected area management here. Uh, in the right corner is the the involvement of local committees in uh, community patrol teams. Um, after finish that period, we come to the final assessment and the site visit. Uh, we cover along with the first site in uh, in Vietnam. Go to this uh, stage so. Uh, we have quite a big group of uh, uh, eagle members. Three members visited the site. The site was small. We met the, the uh, different stakeholders, uh, have interviewed, discussed with them. And this, this field visit is very important for creating the green listing process. Uh, it's the head, you know, uh, it had, help to, to get the um, uh, supplementary uh, information and also is help documentation the evidence because um, I think that many is in quite many other countries in just in our area it is something very good but sometimes uh, it did not document other efforts. So when we go to the uh, assessment um, stage, we have not enough evidence to show that okay, we are doing good. So after that, yeah, Ego decided that the site met on the indicator and we submitted to the uh, release uh, committee. And with the witnesses from uh, reviewer from um, AS, the ASI. And also reviewer, another story. We have the first uh, reviewer, uh, a foreigner who cannot speak in Vietnamese with a supporter go in, a supporter in, uh, in Vietnam who can speak Vietnamese, but the level of commitment is not enough. So we have new reviewer and now we have a a Vietnamese reviewer who, you know, active and who uh, uh, participated with all the activity to help us to uh, speed up the process. And yeah, last year, uh, September 2020, well, at least the uh, worth it with a really certificate. Yeah, and here is the uh, uh, note from the release committee on the site. And yeah, of course, we just look at all the uh, uh, in indicator. It does still something that belongs is not fully meet. And it's very important for the site to look at this and yeah, continue to improve the performance to meet on the standard. So benefits uh, from um, joining the list program is the, uh, I think the first important is benchmarking conservation achievement. They know yeah, where they go, uh, where, did, uh, where did they, uh, where they come, and where they can go in future. Uh, they were recognized by international and national conservation committee. So very important uh, and very important. We can assess technical and financial support from many different people, from IUCN, from other partners, from Eagles member, from mentors. And when they have, uh, uh, they can pro uh, prove that they are doing good. They can assess the Challenging, uh, challenges, yeah, mm. aligning 
Vietnamese practices with, with really standards is not easy. I think it's always um, the mm, uh, same with all other countries. Uh, in Vietnam, when uh, try to assess governments, uh, it's very different. I found it's the same in China when my Chinese colleagues said that governments have no good definition of, of uh, termin, um, uh, uh, not, not easy translated term in our language. Uh, and yeah, legislation for PI management in Vietnam sometimes yeah, to widen, widening the participation of other sector in PIE management and decision making process. You know, sometimes our centralized system uh, stop the participation or engagement of the uh, public, of local committees and other uh, stakeholders. Um, yeah. Because, yes, I think it's the same in many countries because the assessment is not uh, compulsory and not uh, 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 prescribed by law. So, no aside financial and technical resources for this kind of assessment. So, it still depend on the uh, you know, donor project. Uh, some kind of outsider support. Our next step is to fulfill the condition required by the Greenwich Committee, as I mentioned last slide. And yeah, they hope to yield really standard what they still lacking to and what they already achieved to, to guide the management activities in future. So lesson learned, yeah, pre-list is the uh, quite complicated process. So yeah, not easy. Evidence needs we need yeah, involve, uh, involvement of uh, reviewers and ego members who you know not always have their first job, but uh, it's what to do. Yeah, just did exercise. It's very useful for on-site, uh, different legal status in uh, guiding management action. In Vietnam, we have different level categories of protected areas. And also uh, the concept area uh, also can use us yeah, to identify the gaps from that design action plan to fill the gaps. And from that, they can achieve and to move to international standards. And yeah, I think somebody already mentioned Malaysia, for example, mentoring is very important in assessment process. In Vietnam, we have prep uh, uh, on issues. As I think in, in the presentation that already mentioned, we have not many, yeah, not easy to find expert to work with us in that we have good people who can be in uh, a member of egos, so they cannot be a mentor. So sometimes it's have to be harmonized. For example, um, for ego in Vietnam, first of all, we have uh, 13 ego members. One, you know, he relocated, he resettled in other countries, so we have 12. And one guy who, who worked very close with Valang. So by the end, he decided that, yeah, that person in uh, reside from uh, ego members and become the first mentor, uh, mentor in Vietnam. As a summary, uh, protected area management agency in Vietnam is Vian Forest. Uh, mm, they uh, who manage the special use forest the system in Vietnam can you really standard monitor and evaluate evaluate PIC system? Yes. Yeah, donor can you really indicator to assess and evaluate investment impacts? 
uh, till this end, yeah, we have uh, many uh, donor and other development partners already discussed and ready to to use release for other sites in Vietnam, for example, CISS, or uh, recently WWF uh, under uh, uh, an USAID project with you release to accept their project site in Vietnam. Yeah, release team is now uh, developing the uh, benchmarking and evaluation index value for release criteria. This will be something you know, more quantitative and easy to, to use, and you should have to make the assessment more straightforward and easier for uh, practitioners. Yeah, it's the end of my presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, too, and congratulations again to Vietnam for having the first uh, green listed site in, in Southeast Asia. And uh, we wish you good success with the other sites as well. I see that a number of questions have come in in the chat box, so I'll turn over to Alex to facilitate. Uh, we've got probably uh, just maybe 10 minutes or so for any any questions that you might have. So please do continue to put those into the uh, into the chat box. Uh, Alex, over to you. Yeah, thanks, Scott. Very uh, <clears throat> very interesting series of presentations from my perspective uh, there to hear about some of the experiences. And we've had a couple of questions come in on the uh, on the chat, and allow me to to present those. The first I'd like to direct to colleagues in uh, Korea, firstly, and colleagues in Korea, could could you tell us about, uh, or could you comment on how managers at the site level have perceived the green list, list and the green listing process? And did they find the process useful for their, for their own management needs? And what has been the, the response at the sites after achieving green list certification. I know that some of the sites in uh, Korea are currently undergoing a re-evaluation, but um, could you tell us about the responses from the site managers and how they saw the process as being useful in Korea? Okay, so the site managers uh, also pleased to introduce so implementing the IUCN Green List as a management direction of how to manage the national park properly. But they 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 also happy to got a more chance to communicate with better stakeholders on specific issues. So so which are the Green List provide some indicator to communicate with stakeholders. So that's the that's the, the make some opportunity. To, to local managers to communicate with stakeholders. They're happy to communicate with stakeholders on, on that specific issues. But, but however, they, they have some burdens, I mean, the, the workload and some burdens to, to prove their achievement. There are, there are other, other the audit system, already they got some audit system on some 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 management to, to to evaluation internally the the usually usually the headquarter the, the evaluate the local office and some other the objective objective groups to 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 assess their achievement internally so so they they sort that, that uh, another kind of the, the evaluation process. So, so that's why we focus on the reduce the, the kind of burdens to local steps. That's the, the feeling of the, the, the feeling of uh, local steps on the IUCN greenness, I think. And then after achieve the IUCN greenness, the, the, the local stakeholder, so, so wondering, so is there any change to manage the national park to, to already be the Asian greenness? The, the, some management approach is changed or not? They just wondering. And local NGO also, the, the, 
worried about that. So, and some, some local NGO has got expectation to, to more focusing on the conservation, that kind of the, the expectation from the from local NGOs. But as you know well, but there is no change. The, 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 the national park management is the, the managed by according to the national act. They said there are no big change, but the one change is uh, the recognition, awareness on the importance of national parks. And that uh, we more focusing on the, the more chance to communicate with stakeholders. As is also the, I think the, to encourage more communication with the stakeholders is the main benefit to implementing ice and greenness to national parks. Mm, is, is, is there any question on that? Is it proper answer? I, I'm not sure. <laughs> no, I think that's fine, Mr. Hagyong. You know, I think you've addressed the, the questions very well. So thank you, thank you for that response. Um, okay. If I could direct the next question to our colleagues from Malaysia and particularly to Mr. Aceh Chung uh, from uh, the protected area in Malaysia, and that is, the question is about uh, the costs of green listing at a site level, the financial commitments that need to be made to achieve green listing. And uh, could you share with us what some of the costs have been and then to become a, uh, a candidate site and uh, to go through the green listing process? And how were these sourced? I remember during your presentation, you talked about some of the challenges in finding resources but what do you think the, the costs have been uh, so far in the process of uh, undertaking the candidate phase? Um, okay, um, I, I think I mentioned that in my presentations that we don't have funding for that. So all these applications are, are using our extra time. So it's only a two, a two, per, two man job. It probably require more people to do it but uh, because of uh, Rift Guardian is a very small organization since we have only like, um, currently we have only like 15. So there are five management staff, uh, scientists, and also um, the others 10 were just a few workers. So everything are very tight. So application for green is, uh, we don't have extra fund for that. Is that answering the questions? That's fine, actually. And maybe, Dev, if we could bring you in uh, on, on this particular question as well. And uh, from your experience already with the green listing program, what are the kind of costs that are associated with the green listing candidate phase uh, for a given site? What are some of the expectations there? Can I have yeah. the questions again? I cannot, oh, yeah. I cannot catch you. Uh, Dev? Yeah, sorry. Were you directing that question to me? Alex? Yes. Yeah. Yes, to you, Jeff, if I might. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, I think the it's a it's a good question, and the the um, uh, it's it's true as Malaysia says. Um, the currently, let's say, at a global level, uh, as much as we would love to have a, a global green list fund to be able to to support um, sites to implement the standard, um, uh, we don't. What we find um, typically happens is uh, that the um, either yeah the, as as is happening in, in Malaysia the um, the sites are incorporating the standard into into their existing um, management cycles um, or um, uh, projects related to protected area uh, management effectiveness or governance are integrating the green list standard and getting um, some budget from from relevant projects that are um, whose aims are aligned with, uh, with the objectives of the standard. Um, so there's a diversity of ways that, that sites um, will uh, raise resources that are required uh, for interventions needed to comply with the standard. So that's at the, at the site uh, implementation level. From, um, from the certification process itself, uh, the, the, um, the certification itself is free um, and the standard is open access. The, the real the the eagle members uh, serve as volunteers so there isn't a there isn't a staff time cost from uh, for eagle members 
uh, the main cost really is around um, meet, eat, the meeting logistics of um, getting together the expert groups um, who would typically meet in person, although with the, in the light of COVID currently, a lot of these uh, meetings are taking place virtually. Um, but typically, um, the, the global average we say is um, to allow for about 10,000 US dollars uh, per year that would cover the costs of say 50% of that to cover the cost of Eagle meetings. Um, typically there will be uh, one meeting uh, for the training uh, that typically happens in person. So that's a two day meeting um, and at least one other meeting uh, for an evaluation meeting. Um, so on average, you could say about two meetings per year for the expert group. Um, the other 50% of the of that budget um, is for is uh, to contribute to the cost of an independent reviewer. Uh, this is a, a third party reviewer that essentially serves as an auditor um, to make sure that uh, all of the rules and procedures in the IUCN user manual are being followed um, by the Eagle and and by IUCN. It's an IUCN standard, so we need to need to make sure that there's an um, an independent reviewer that's uh, reviewing these processes. So as has come up in in some of the presentations, uh, each country has an um, has an independent reviewer, and that uh, that cost um, is typically something uh, that's contributed to from the country. Hope that answers the question, Alex. Thanks. That's great, Dev. Yeah, I think you've characterised some of the costs there, um, the anticipated costs certainly, uh, quite well. I'd like to turn to just one more question. Uh, there are a couple more in the chat. Um, I've noted those. We're running short of time, so I'm just going to address one more of those questions. And I'd uh, like to bring in Professor Li uh, from China. And Professor Li, in your, in your presentation, you, you made an excellent summary of some of the benefits of, of the green list uh, process uh, for sites in China in promoting excellence in management at the site, bringing recognition to good management at the site, uh, at sites, encouraging multi-stakeholder participation, and uh, also standardizing management and management practices. And that's what we heard from some of the other pre presenters as well. However, I'd like to turn to the point that you made and, and a question that was raised in the chat, and that is about promoting interest uh, in tourism. Have you seen the green listing process in being a candidate site and having um, uh, green listed sites, certified sites, have you seen in, an increasing interest in tourism coming in those sites as well. Professor Lee. Uh, hello, uh, Professor Lee is not uh, uh, right here now, so. Okay, that's fine. Maybe uh, do in Vietnam. Mr. Tung in Vietnam, what about at Van Long Nature Reserve? Has the green listing process in, uh, in that particular site, has it brought greater interest from the tourism sector in, uh, in Vietnam at Van Long Nature Reserve? Uh, maybe it's not a good time to answer the question. You know that the tourist uh, industry is facing a terrible uh, period right now. Well, last year, Van Long received some, you know, 40, 50, 60 something thousands of uh, visitors. But this year, I think that's around 2000. It changed so much, and even the the, the uh, tourism uh, enterprise there. Yeah, they facing many problems, and it's not exactly to 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 uh, if to to make any you know statement right now. However, the very big in investor in in that area, you might know by uh, Chang'an Biding. Uh, he's uh, some kind of uh, Vietnamese millionaire, multi-millionaires. Uh, who invest in two um, uh, tourism areas uh, in North and South Vietnam. He's very interested, and he even promised Vietnam managers to, you know, invest in the 
uh, release the certificate certification ceremonies for that. However, because it's too busy uh, by end of the year and also beginning of this year, so it's not happen. But of course, it's yeah, it's draw the interest from the tourism industry. Sure. Better. That's great. Thanks, Tu. And uh, I've noted the additional comments in the chat. I'll pass those on to the facilitators of the, the webinar and uh, to be recorded. And uh, I'll pass back to you, Scott, to, uh, to take it on to the next session. Great. Thank you, Alex. And uh, so we just have one final presentation, very short, just uh, five slides, just to tell you a little bit about IUCN's thoughts for the, the future of taking forward the, uh, the IUCN Green List in, in Asia. Uh, if I could have the next slide, please. So starting first, just looking at the current status of the Green List, I think uh, a quick summary of that is that we are seeing a uh, rapid take up of the standard uh, across the region and growing interest in the standard. So at the moment we have Green List processes formally underway in six countries in Asia. Bhutan, China, Laos, Malaysia, Republic of Korea, and Vietnam. We currently have 10 sites that have been inscribed on the green list, and there are something like 25 additional sites that are at some stage in the process. We have discussions underway with at least four other countries about starting the green list process, and we have uh, a number of sources of funding to, to help support the process. We're receiving support from the Ministry of Environment Korea, uh, the Ministry for the Environment in Germany, and we also have the Tech for Nature project, which is uh, under the IUCN Huawei partnership. All of these are providing a certain amount of dedicated support for taking forward the green list in, in Asia. We're also increasingly trying to build the green list into large regional projects and programs as we develop those. So just to give you an example of one of those, uh, we're about to start the second phase, the implementing phase of the Bay of Bengal Large Marine Ecosystem uh, Project. This is a, a GEF funded project being implemented by FAO. And here we hope to use the green list standard uh, and apply that to marine protected areas. So that's a quick overview of current status. Priorities for IUCN are really, it really comes down to, to two issues. How can we continue to provide effective backstopping, technical support, capacity building for those countries and sites that are already embarking on the green list journey? Whilst at the same time, how can we meet this growing demand that we're seeing across the region uh, from other countries that are interested in taking up the green list standard. And of course, all of these things have implications in terms of, of time, uh, resources and, and staffing. Next, please. So what is IUCN planning to do to try to address some of these, some of these issues, some of these requirements? Well, one of the first things that we are planning to do is to develop a regional green list strategy this will really aim to set forth a strategic framework uh, for taking forward the green list in Asia. It will correspond to, correlate to the global green list strategy, but look specifically at the issues and priorities in Asia and try to uh, set out a number of structured priorities uh, over the next three to five years for taking forward the standard. We hope to appoint a full-time regional green list coordinator uh, very soon, uh, who will be based here in the IUCN Asia regional office in Bangkok. And that person's full-time job will be to support the green list standard, the rollout of the standard across Asia. And this will be someone who will be available to provide technical support, who will be available to uh, answer questions and queries, who will be able to assist in capacity building, et cetera. So we see that position as being uh, really quite, quite key to taking forward the standard. And we hope that we will have someone in post uh, sometime this year. 
Obviously, we're continuing to fundraise for the green list where, wherever possible, uh, as I mentioned, by integrating the green list into project proposals to try to ensure that we have a, a pipeline of funding support coming through to, to keep the green list running. We're very keen to continue to promote peer-to-peer -peer learning and, and cross-country exchange, uh, for example, through the Asia Protected Areas Partnership, as, uh, as we were discussing earlier. Uh, as I also mentioned, we've recently established a green list working group under APAP to fulfill exactly, exactly this purpose. But we're also keen to continue events like this, such as you know, this, this webinar, uh, technical workshops, uh, perhaps later on, once travel becomes possible again, we can look at uh, exchanges between countries and those, those sorts of things. Finally, we're keen to continue to raise awareness of the Green List, to build support for the Green List, uh, to work with partners like the ASEAN Center for Biodiversity, and to make maximum use of some of the big regional and international events that will be coming up uh, over the next year or so. One of those is the second Asia Parks Congress, which will be hosted by Sabah, Malaysia in May, 2022. And one of the core themes of that Congress will be around effective management of protected areas. So that's obviously a, a golden opportunity to uh, bring countries together to share experience and also to continue to raise awareness of the standard uh, and promote awareness of the standard. Next slide, please. In terms of further uh, resources and information, if you would like to, to know more about the Green List standard, uh, there is a dedicated Green List website. Uh, this is still under development, uh, but it is operational and you can access it at the, uh, at the address there. I'd really encourage you to take a look. There's a, a wealth of information on there. We would also be very happy to arrange a virtual introduction to the IUCN Green List of maybe you know, one or two hours for your, for your country or for your national protected area system. If that's something in which you might be interested, please just, just let us know and uh, we would be happy to, to organize that. And finally, if you, if you have questions, if uh, you know, today has, has inspired you, but you still have, have queries that we weren't able to answer today, please don't hesitate to, to reach out. Uh, you're very welcome to reach out to me in the first instance, uh, and I'll try to assist. But if I can't answer your question, then uh, I'll seek support from the larger Greenlist community, from, from Dev and headquarters, uh, James Hardcastle, from uh, the World Commission on Protected Areas and, and others. So please do, do reach out. Next slide, please. So this is my last slide, and it's really just to invite you to, to join us on the IUCN Green List journey towards more effectively and more fairly managed, protected, and conserved areas. So thank you very much for your participation today. And just before we close, I'd just like you to, to hand over to my colleague, uh, Mr. Ko, uh, who is seconded from the Korea National Park Service, but working here with us in IUCN as the program officer, protected areas, just to give some final remarks. Thank you very much. Over Thank to you, Ko. Scott. Oh, yes, that brings us to the end of today's webinar. I hope that you find it interesting and informative, and that it will have inspire you to take forward the ICN Green List in your own country if you're not already doing so. I would like to thank all the speakers for sharing their experiences and insight with us today. It has been particularly valuable to hear about the benefits and challenges of using the ICN Green List at the site level. I would also like to thank all of our participants for making the time to join the call today. I know that everyone has a busy schedule and competing demands on their time, and we are grateful for, the, for your participation. Finally, if you should have any remaining question from today's webinar or would like further information about the IOCN Green List, please do not hesitate to reach out to IOCN and we would be happy to help. Thank you. Thank you very much, everyone, and uh, enjoy the rest of your, your evening. Thank you once again for participating and uh, please stay in touch.
Bye for now. Thank you again. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much.